Good morning. <clears throat> I am Council Member Antonio Reynoso, the Chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Thank you for attending this oversight hearing on the 2017 Waste Ca Characterization Study. We will also hear two pre-considered bills today sponsored by Council Members Matteo. The first will raise penalties for littering from a vehicle, and the second will man mandate that the Department of Sanitation create a plan to increase enforcement of littering out of vehicles. The 2017 Waste Characterization Study found that we, as a city, are creating less garbage. Both the amount of waste generated and the amount of waste collected for the landfill-bound waste stream uh, went down between 2005 and 2017, all while the population of the city grew from 8.2 million to over 8.5 million. We need to continue this trend of creating less, wa less waste. Getting to zero waste in New York City is an important and extremely ambitious goal. To accomplish this, New Yorkers need to have an easy access uh, to an interest in and an interest in recycling. The SNY has been working to educate the public, but we need to do more to promote good recycling habits. It is clear from the study that one of our largest opportunities to divert materials from landfill is composting. I am looking forward to learning the SNY's plan on how they will engage and support the public moving forward, specifically in the collection of recycling and organics material. I greatly appreciate the SNY's hard work, but there's still so much work left to do and the opportunity to do better if we hope to achieve the goal of diverting zero waste to landfill by 2030, or diverting 100% of the waste to landfill. It is my position that this can only be achieved through bold measures, uh, such as commercial waste zones, save as you throw system, and banning materials that cannot be diverted from landfill. I look forward to hearing testimony from DSNY, environmental advocates, and other interested groups about the experience with the city's efforts to reduce waste, waste and any advice that they have <clears throat> on how we could do, be doing more. I will turn it over uh, to the panel in a couple of seconds. And I also want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Ballone from Queens. Thank you for being here. Uh, and recent news that plastic bags are going to get banned by the state. I know you guys are excited about that. Um, it, you can comment on it if you want. Um, uh, I'm really excited about today's uh, waste characterization study I'm hearing uh, because we're, we're going to dive into the details on exactly what we're throwing out. But I also just want to mention, it wasn't in my notes, uh, there was an agreement that there would also be a waste characterization study for like the private uh, carding industry. Or, so I just want to start that conversation over to make sure that we can follow through on that. And it was an agreement made under the SWAMP plan, I believe. So I just want to make sure that that is also something we can address in your comments. Um, outside of that, I want to allow for um, Gregory Anderson, Catherine Kitchener, and Samantha McBride um, to uh, begin the testimony from the Department of Sanitation. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and we're just going to swear to you in very quick. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to answer council member questions honestly? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Councilman Reynoso and members of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste. I'm Samantha McBride, Director of Research and Operations for the Bureau of Recycling and Sustainability at the Department of Sanitation, and I'm joined by Greg Anderson, who's the Chief of Staff, and Catherine Kitchener, who is the Director of Policy and Programs for the Bureau of Recycling and Sustainability. We're pleased to be here this morning on behalf of the department to present the results of our most recent citywide waste characterization study, officially known as the 2017 Residential, School, and NYCHA Waste Characterization Study. This study was conducted pursuant to Local Law 40 of 2010, and I'd like to call your attention to the screen to begin our presentation. The department conducted the study over three seasons during the spring, summer, and fall in 2017. Our method involved randomly selecting over 800 different refuse, recycling, and organic truck routes to ensure that our results were statistically representative of residential waste throughout the entire city, including each of the five boroughs. We also randomly selected school collection routes and New York City Housing Authority, or NYCHA, container routes for sampling. All of these routes were collected in a standard fashion without foreknowledge of our sanitation crews. 
Using truck numbers, we then identified sample trucks with study posters at the garage so that they would be easily identified when they went to discharge their loads at transfer stations and recycling vendors, as shown here in this photo. At those sites, we took samples of 100 to 200 pounds from loads on the tipping floor. These samples were labeled and then brought to an enclosed facility at Fresh Kill Staten Island for sorting and quantification. Each sample was emptied onto a sort table and then hand sorted by trained workers into 70 main sort categories as well as an additional 172 subcategories. This was done by meticulously inspecting waste contents and separating them into labeled buckets around the sort table and at subsort tables elsewhere in the facility. Each bucket was weighed and the net weight of the contents was recorded as a data point under strict quality control. Using this method, we gained a detailed understanding of the variety of products and materials in New York City's residential school and NYCHA waste streams. Our study builds on decades of research and analysis in the evolving composition of the department-managed solid waste stream by providing statistics on the types of materials collected and diverted from the waste stream in New York City, what changes, New York, what changes in, have taken place in what New Yorkers buy and use every day. And the study also highlights opportunities for the department to develop and grow programs to meet our goal of sending zero waste to landfills by 2030. The 2017 Waste Characterization Study was the first comprehensive look at the waste stream since 2013, and it follows a similar study done in 2005. We used an industry standard methodology that entailed random sampling for, of over 800 truck routes, as described earlier, to ensure statistically representative results for residential curbside collections in all boroughs and to look at changes over time. For the first time, we also characterized curbside organics in those areas that were receiving service at the time of the study. And as mentioned before, we also looked at the composition of school waste and NYCHA refuse. I'll be detailing some of the study results in the slides to follow, but to start, some of the most important findings from the study, as shown in this pie chart here, uh, tell us that New Yorkers are producing less waste at home than ever before, and 68% of what we do throw away belongs either in a curbside recycling bin, 34%, or an organics bin. Organics, including food scraps, food soil paper, and yard waste, are the largest single category and still growing category of waste, representing the biggest opportunity for New Yorkers to divert waste from landfills. New York, I'm uh, sorry, DSNY currently offers special programs to target much of an additional 9% as shown here that is readily diverted through other means. We are proud of our programs to keep textiles, harmful household products, and electronic waste out of disposed refuse. With regard to electronic waste, there's particularly encouraging news. New York State implemented an electronic waste disposal ban in 2015, and since 2012, actually, New York's uh, DSNY has launched and facilitated a wide array of programs to make electronics recycling convenient for residents. As a result, electronic waste has de declined by 60% citywide. Now on to some more detailed findings. As mentioned before, our waste stream is diminishing. Over the past decade, the overall weight of both refuse and recycling in curbside collections has declined, even as the number of New Yorkers has grown. The drops are most marked for refuse. Uh, for recycling, we saw a <coughs> decline between 2005 and 2013, but since then, both paper recycling which includes different types of paper and cardboard, and what we call MGP recycling, which includes metals, glass containers, and rig rigid plastics and beverage cartons, have actually increased. Now, before we proceed, a word about measurement. In our results, we present quantities in terms of pounds per household per year to show how the overall waste stream is changing. We also pre present capture rates, which are the ratio of how much New Yorkers actually recycle to how much total recyclable material 
is in the curbside waste stream, how much is out there to be recycled, if you will. To illustrate the relative share of each material in the waste stream, we use percent composition. Each of these statistics should be considered independently from each other, but combined, they paint a picture of what is going on with recycling and refuse in New York City. If we examine the materials that make up residential curbside recyclables over time, we see some marked changes. Let's start here with paper and cardboard. The bars show the total amount of each type of paper in the residential curbside waste stream. Cardboard collections have increased steadily over the last three studies, while the quantity of newspaper has fallen dramatically over time. Mixed, low-grade paper, including junk mail, smooth cardboard, colored paper, uh, has fallen as well, although not as sharply. These shifts reflect changes that we all experience. There is less use of printed material and more online ordering, which results in more corrugated cardboard. Looking at these changes, we observe trends in production and consumption that ultimately determine what ends up in waste. In addition, we see that the capture rate for corrugated cardboard is the highest of all paper recyclables. It's 79%, meaning that out of all corrugated cardboard that residents discard, 79% makes it correctly into the recycling bin. Capture rates for newspaper and mixed low-grade paper were lower. Moving on to metals, we see that some metal categories, like large or bulk items, steel cans, and other metals, have diminished over time, while aluminum cans and other items have slightly increased. At the same time, we see that capture rates for aluminum products are lower than for other metals. The aluminum can, one of the most iconic recycling, recyclable products, has a capture rate of just 30%. This is likely due to frequent canning of cans bearing a five cent deposit. Aluminum foil and other containers have even lower capture rate of 15%. This may be due to the tendency of aluminum foil to be food soiled when discarded. The situation around plastics is more complex due to the immense variety of these lightweight materials. In this slide, I show categories of plastics we accept in our recycling program. In 2013, uh, in order to make recycling more easy and convenient, the city expanded curbside recycling to accept all rigid plastics. This change took place shortly after the last study, the 2013 study, had been completed. We see increases in the amount of material recycled across all types of plastics, but the increases are largest for the newly added groups, bulky rigid plastics and appliances, single-use plastic plates, cups, and cutlery, and rigid packaging like yogurt tubs and deli trays. Turning to other recyclables, we see that glass containers are declining overall in waste. Today, the average New Yorker discards 15 fewer pounds per household per year of glass bottles and jugs than they did in 2005. And capture rates are holding steady at around 63%. Sorry about that. We collect beverage cartons and aseptic boxes with our commingled metal, glass, and plastic recycling for processing and marketing reasons. We see that this form of packaging is declining in discards overall as well, down from a little over 11 pounds per household per year to a little over seven today. About 8% of all beverage cartons are incorrectly included with paper recycling, and the capture rate for them in MGP recycling is a little over 34%. Overall, we can look at average capture rates for both of our recycling streams which average out to around 50%. We've seen improvements in this rate over time, which compares favorably to multi-unit capture rates studied in other cities throughout the United States. Capture rate is one measure of recycling success. Another is contamination rate, the wrong thing in the recycling. Here we see that in residential metal, glass, and plastic collections, the contamination rate is nearly 20%, and has fallen from almost 27% in 2013. 
For paper recycling, the contamination rate is up slightly to almost 9%. Note that in both collections, contamination includes cross-recycling. That means putting paper in the MGP and vice versa. Film plastics, such as bags and wraps, also make up a substantial portion of contamination. Our study sampled curbside organics collections from districts that had service rolled out to them at the time of the study, which was at that time 20 out of 59 districts. Because this program is so new and is not yet implemented citywide, our organics collections are small, but they're growing. And for this reason, we don't show per household pounds per year because not all households are covered. The good news is that these collections are relatively clean, showing about 7% contamination. We also note that at present, curbside organics contain more yard waste than food waste. But as time goes by and the program coverage expands, we expect to see the food waste percentage increase. Speaking of good news, I'd like to draw your attention to electronic waste or e-waste. Starting in January 1st, 2015, New York State law prohibited the disposal of e-waste in refuse collections. Well before this date, however, the department had launched a number of programs, including apartment programs, drop-off sites and events, and starting in 2016 in Staten Island and in 2017 in North Brooklyn, on-demand curbside pickup to make recycling of electronics convenient. These programs were funded in part by electronics producer under state extended producer responsibility programs and private companies that supplemented outlets with take back and mail back options of their own. We see a substantial decline in e-waste between 2013 and 2017. From nearly 17 pounds a year to a little over five pounds a year today per New York City household. I'd like to close now uh, with a brief review of the other two waste streams we looked at. The first is school waste. We characterized refuse and recycling setouts of schools that are not yet participating in the school's organics program so that we could get a baseline understanding of the total composition of school waste. What we found is that in aggregate, waste from schools, which is the sum total of refuse and recycling, contains roughly the same percentage of recyclables as residential waste, but far more compostable organics than do residential collections. We also found that while paper recycling capture rates uh, in schools were close to residential capture rates, MGP capture rates for schools were far lower. In addition, paper and MGP recycling collections from schools are much more contaminated. In the case of MGP, this contamination rate is quite high and composed mainly of compostable organics that are improperly placed in the recycling bin for schools, metal, glass, and plastic. Finally, some highlights from our characterization of NYCHA refuse. As of now, curbside recycling collections from NYCHA properties are extremely low in tonnage. The vast majority of NYCHA discards are in the form of refuse. If we look at the composition of this refuse, it looks a lot like the composition of residential discards in total. What this tells us is that there's enormous room to grow curbside recycling programs at NYCHA so as to capture and to divert paper, MGP, and ultimately compostable organics. In this presentation, I've only scratched the surface of the detail on the many categories and subcategories, which number in the hundreds, which we measured in this study. We have published the data in easily accessible Excel files that allow the public to look in depth at different products and materials and discards, make their own calculations, and draw their own conclusions. You can download the full report and associated documents along with the Excel files at the DSNY website. I'll now separately turn briefly to the two pre-considered bills on the agenda today. The first bill increases the fines imposed for littering from a motor vehicle, and the second bill requires the commissioner to issue a report to the mayor and council regarding how the department can increase enforcement of this infraction. The department supports efforts to discourage littering, including through increased enforcement and higher penalties, and we thank the council for its support 
as we work to keep New York City healthy, safe, and clean. This concludes our presentation this morning. Thank you for providing us the opportunity to share with you the results of this study at this hearing today, and we now welcome your questions. Thank you for that presentation. Just want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Aspinall as well from Brooklyn, my neighbor. How are you doing? Doing good. Uh, so I want to get to uh, something that, that is important. The 23% other uh, in slide in page six. Can we just go to page six? We're going to try our best to do slides and questions at the same time. Um, yeah, so the 23% other. Uh, if we're going to get to zero waste, we need to pay attention to things that the waste characterization study designates as other, um, which includes materials for which there are no or very limited options for beneficial, beneficial use at this time. Uh, can you talk about what uh, you're going to do to make these items divertible or limit their use? And what I have here, and you let me know if I'm, I'm around the, the, the right area, small-scale building or material scrap, furniture and household wood products, treated wood and lumber, carpeting, various plastic film, flexible and foam products, multi-material items, disposable diapers, and animal byproducts. If, if mm -hmm. we, how can we ever get to zero if this 23% is always going to be other? Um, what are your plans? Um, so a number of the products, um, C&D waste, carpet, furniture, um, have alternative uses before disposal. So one of the things that we have currently is the Donate NYC program, which encourages residents to donate these materials um, before disposal. We have partners, for example, Big Reuse, that take construction and demolition debris and resell it and it gets a second life. In addition to that, um, things like carpet also have the potential for extended producer responsibility legislation. Um, so we're focusing on those areas of things that there are solutions for. Okay, so um, I guess I, I want to dive deeper into this. Into this, I know you, you you generally did give us some some options. I tell you, and I, I do this all the time. There's no one in the general public outside of the people in this room and the people all here that know anything about what you're talking about. Do going to donate NYC and so forth is just not something that people are aware of. What is DSNY doing to, to uh, I guess, educate or inform the public of options that they have so that they don't put carpeting and, and treated wooden lumber and household furniture products into the waste stream, but instead go to donate NYC or figure out new alternatives? So I think there, there are a few answers here. Uh, the first is, is obviously we, we can do more and, and we've tried to do more education about what New Yorkers can do with regard to donate um, on an annual basis. We, our Donate NYC partners collect about 50 million pounds of uh, material for reuse. That's furniture, clothing, uh, uh, C&D items, um, a whole range of products. Uh, so we're doing a lot there already. We, we definitely can do more on education, but there's also a, a big policy perspective here. Um, we have things in here, about 1% of that number is foam products. I think that you know, we, we have said twice now uh, that foam products are not recyclable, are never going to be recyclable, and you know, we don't think they have a place in our waste stream, we don't think they have a place in our lives. There are recyclable, compostable, reusable alternatives, and we wanna focus on pushing people towards those alternatives we want to support a ban on, on foam products. That's an easy step we can take. Um, so I think it's, it's things like that. There are harder decisions down the road. Obviously, you know, some of these items are, are things like pet waste. Uh, we don't have a great solution for pet waste right now. Um, there's things like diapers and sanitary products. We don't have great solutions for those right now. But I think rather than focus on those things, which are 2% of the, the pie and don't necessarily have great alternatives. Let's focus on the 34%, which is residential curbside recyclables, of which we're currently collecting half. Um, so I think we can get a lot more bang for our buck by um, focusing on those things, things like textiles, which make up 6%, um, hugely ripe for reuse uh, and recycling, um, and you know where I think we have a lot of, of good stories to tell New Yorkers. No, and, and I agree, we, we could focus on the things that we're doing better, uh, but. I, 
I, I don't believe, I, I believe uh, we need to stay focused on getting to zero waste by 2030. And if we're going to take that serious, then we need to start talking about polystyrene and, and getting rid of foam um, from our waste stream um, and talk about what we need, a plan for each and every one of these things that are part of the 23%. Um, it should, it's parallel, all of it. And I agree that it is a policy question and we need to continue to have that. Um, hopefully the members here of the sanitation committee would hear your plea to ban foam or styrofoam <laughs> And we could finally get that done um, and, and move to products again that are, are recyclable or that we can actually be, get that divert. Um, then you talk about the 34% the of curbside recyclables of which we seem to be capturing, capturing fi about 50%. Um, would you, talk, you mentioned canners. Uh, can you explain um, what canners are and what, um, is there anything that you believe uh, can capture what they're recycling because the canners are actually, you know, they're, they're not sending the, the, the trash to space. Uh, so where is that, where is that going? And, and can you just explain that? Um, well, by canners, I mean any individual who takes it upon his or herself to redeem a container. Um, and I agree with you, it's not going to space, it's, it's recycling, it's diversion. Um, at the moment, we do um, receive reports from two of the major um, deposit container redeemers in New York City at the end of every fiscal year, and we add in those tonnages to our overall assessment of diversion and how it's going. But that's voluntarily provided, and it's incomplete. Unfortunately, as you know, it's a state law, deposit redemption, and New York State does not track tonnages. Um, and report tonnages for for redeemed containers. That would be the way, they used to, that would be the way for us to measure that. So can, who are the two canning, I guess, locations that report to the you? The two redeemers. The two redeemers, uh, thank the, you. The, the two redeemers are Envipco and Tamra. They are big consolidated redeemers. And I guess they own those machines where you put the cans in and the um, I would need to bone up on the details of exactly their, their business model, um, but uh, they are the ones that supply us um, voluntarily with the tonnages that they redeem in New York City per se. Okay, so I know we can't change the 5% deposit or get rid of it or do any of that in the city, but can we mandate that these, if you're doing business in the city and you're collecting um, metal or glass, um, that you report to the Department of Sanitation? Is that something that's within our purview? We could look at the specifics of the state law, but uh, I believe that we are preempted from, from acting on this in the same way that state law preempts us from uh, local enforcement or reporting responsibilities for other uh, types of producer responsibility in recycling, uh, plastic bag recycling. For example, we are prohibited from uh, enforcing the law in New York City uh, or uh, collecting any data from participating retailers. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I'll, I'll try to get that up to the state some way, somehow. Um, the governor's really hot right now, uh, so we might want to take advantage of this. We don't really got a couple months left, so we, we got to get the ball rolling. Um, so um, th that, that's good to know. The, the canners are someone, you know, a lot of folks, it's a very hard issue to tackle here. We know it's illegal, actually, to, to pick up curbside. Once it's on the curb, it belongs to the city of New York, right? Can so, you explain that as so well? So just to clarify, it is, it is not illegal uh, to be a canner uh, walking around with a bag uh, or even a shopping cart. Uh, it is technically illegal under city law, um, a law that was passed by council in 2012, to collect those products with a motor vehicle. Um, it's also illegal to take things like refrigerators, like uh, stoves, um, air conditioners, other large bulky metal appliances uh, that are set out for collection. And um, it, a particular concern there is, is things that contain CFCs. We have a program to remove those CFCs, uh, CFCs safely and want to make sure that's happening uh, and that the products are also getting recycled. So the individual counters that are on the sidewalk and collect cans, that is legal to do? That is, it is not explicitly legal under city law. Can you repeat that? It, it is not illegal under city law. The, the department um, does not oppose that, that action. Obviously, you know, we, we're sending trucks out to pick up that material, so we 
Um, we'd love to have that and be able to put it in our, our nice pie charts. Uh, but you know, we, we have no issue with that practice continuing because we, we know that that material is getting recycled as well. Okay. But we would love to be able to keep track of, of how much material they're collecting and really be able to take credit for the great work that New Yorkers are doing. I appreciate. So I appreciate that that you know there's no enforcement happening to these canners that are traditionally poor people that are just walking through trying to make trying to make some literally a five a nickel a nickel at a time here. Uh, so, but I do agree that we need to get this into the waste characterization um, study. Uh, also, other cities we we hear a lot about all these great cities that are doing 50 and 60 and 80 and 90 percent. And the city of New York is at what, 18, 19%? Um, can we explain that to folks? I always like to have a, a, like a educational component to exactly why we're not doing the numbers that what San Francisco and maybe Seattle is doing, these other progressive uh, cities. So uh, Samantha McBride is going to answer here, but before she does, I want to note that she is actually one of the nation's leading experts on this, uh, this area. and has studied the differences between cities uh, for probably several decades uh, at this point. So she's more than qualified to, to set the record straight here. Well, I'm happy to have an expert that's going to do that. And you know, a lot of the folks that are going to make comments after you leave are all going to say this. So I want them to cut this out of their testimony after you speak. <laughs> so go ahead, Um The first thing to bear in mind is that when we we talk about our diversion rate of 17 percent in New York City, we're talking just about our residential DSNY collected diversion rate. Many other cities are looking at combined r residential and commercial diversion. Moreover, many other cities are also including construction and demolition debris diversion, and the rates of recycling in that sector are far higher. If we did that equivalent calculation based on sort of the best um, estimates that we have of commercial recycling, um, our diversion rate would be about 55%. Right? So when that's not something that we publish because that is not the way that we present diversion statistics in New York City. Um, and there's a long history uh, connected with that. But when you want to compare um, rates such as San Francisco to New York City, that is really the type of rate that you should be looking at. Um, another um, aspect um, that I would just like to point out is um, if you look at the diversion rate of, let's say, Seattle, which is a city that, unlike San Francisco, is extremely transparent, like New York City is on their data, um, their diversion rate is about 60% for combined commercial and residential. If we look at the pie chart up there, um, and we see that 68% of um, the residential waste stream is either traditional recyclables, paper, metal, glass, and plastic, or organics, um, we start to get a sense of what that 60% is reflecting. So very mature recycling programs and organics programs, plus additional programs to pull things like e-waste, textiles, furniture, and things like that out, out of the waste stream can get a city to 60% diversion. And if you look at Portland, Oregon, for example, they have a similar 60% rate. So in my studies of these, um, of these rates um, across the country, um, I have come to the conclusion that as of today, in 2018, a 60% diversion rate is pretty much state of the art if you're not looking at construction demolition debris. This does not mean that we cannot reduce waste further, but um, to me, that's a more useful comparison than, for example, Seattle's, I'm sorry, San Francisco's 80%. I could go on further about this, and I could actually talk about this for hours. Um, I, I will finally point out that there is a lot of um, work that's being done in the federal s and state um, waste measurement community to start to become much more specific, clear, transparent, and comparable about these statistics so that we can do exactly what you're talking about, which is to get over 
saying Sa San Francisco d diverts 80%, New York diverts 17%, and think that that is a realistic comparison because, frankly, most cities find that problematic. So I'll stop here, but I could talk for hours about yeah, it. We might have a hearing just on that. Okay. And you know, San Francisco is, is, is known to, to put asterisks alongside a lot of its goals and accomplishments. We know it with Barry Bonds, and now uh, <laughs> obviously with how they measure their trash. I really appreciate you saying that because this happens every single time we have a meeting on diversion that we have testimony coming from folks that just just flare up and say, you know, we are terrible, there's 50, 60, 70, 80%. And I just want to put it in perspective. While we might not be where we want to be, and there's always a place for improvement, um, those numbers don't necessarily tell the full story. Um, so the diversion rates are set to, oh, so I'll actually, uh, been we've been joined by uh, Councilmember Chaim Deutsch as well from Brooklyn. So all the Brooklyn members are here um, representing. Um, and I want to allow for my colleagues to ask questions um, because they also have other engagements that they need to attend and I want to make sure that they can make those. So I want to call on Councilmember Espinel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, I'm doing a lot of catching up on learning how, how DSNY interacts with our city outside of our homes. Um, um, so I've been focusing a lot on, on plastics in general, and uh, one of the concerns I'm hearing in my district, or probably even citywide, is um, the amount of plastic that our schools produce when it comes to the cutlery they use, right? Is there any plan by DSNY to kind of work with our school system to cut down on the use of plastic? Yeah, actually, um, a couple years ago, uh, the entire school system switched from foam to a compostable tray, so that was a huge um, impact. It's about a million trays a day, so very large impact there. And in addition, and this is really a DOE question, not a DSNY question, but um, the DOE is also looking to replace all of their plastic cutlery with uh, compostable cu cutlery this fall. Oh, it's amazing. Thank you. Uh, how, how big of a problem is, um, all right, sorry, Going back to plastic bags, right? Not not the bag, not the not the carry out bags, but just bags in general where we, where we wrap our trash in. How big of a problem is are those bags to our waste stream and, and to our landfills, if at all? So I think for those, for you're talking about garbage bags, garbage and, bags, and bags, recyclable bags, bags recyclable clear, blue, percent. black. Yeah. Yeah. So I think. We wouldn't necessarily call them a problem. We see them as a, a necessary evil. Um, we are a, a very dense city, and we we put our garbage out on the curb in bags. There's, you know, we're not the type of city that can can use the fancy automated carts because we love our we love having the ability to park. Um, and those two things just just can't work together. So we see bags as a necessary evil. We have the the infrastructure in place at our recycling facilities to be able to manage them and take them out. I think our recycling vendors, um, and one of them is sitting right in the front row there, uh, smiling. Uh, I think he would agree that if we could get to bagless recycling uh, system, which uh, many other cities have, it would probably make his life easier. Um, and I think Sims would agree. But we've we've designed a, a system that can accommodate them. Uh, but we don't we don't want to encourage New Yorkers to use more bags than they're already using. Are New Yorkers able to recycle without using a bag? Absolutely. Aluminums if, and plastics. If, if you have a, a, a bin, either uh, some, some folks out there still actually have the original uh, curbside recycling bin from the early 90s. Um, others have uh, something you can buy it at, at a local uh, hardware store. You can get a sticker from us uh, for paper or uh, MGP or even just right on there with a permanent marker. And we'll collect it uh, without a bag um, as well. All right, great. Thank you. So yeah, so you could separate your metal glass and plastic, uh, metal glass and plastic without a bag, without bags. You could just throw it in a bin and then put it out if you are in a one family home, let's say. And That's then your correct. organics could go in your brown bin without a bag as well. And then al already you might have only less than 30% of your trash left over, which are like diapers and furniture waste. Um, I, I actually did it one for like about a week and I had like less than 5%, I have diapers now. There's no way to get around diapers, man. Um, but outside of that, there, were, there was very little trash left over. Uh, we have a feedback. Can you guys turn off your mics real quick? Let me see. One, two. All right. Yeah, when, yeah we can. We're very sensitive today. Um, so I want to speak to, to um, I 
But can you can you get into explaining how we are? There's less trash in the system overall, and there's more people. How do how do we accomplish that? Uh, what 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 can we attribute that to? There are many reasons for it. Um, one of them is just the changing nature of our waste stream. I mentioned the decline in paper. Um, we're all aware of that. We all see that. That is somewhat counteracted by the increase in corrugated cardboard. But another um, trend that has been happening for a long time and is really gathering speed is uh, the substitution of lightweight plastics for glass and for heavier plastics. So lightweighting is a trend um, that is taking place in products, and we're seeing the result of that in the waste stream. So that's part of it. Another part of it is increases in recycling, in donation, in reuse. Some of if, if, um, if we're looking at curbside collections, we can directly measure those. If we're looking at um, other forms of diversion, we only have partial knowledge of it. Um, there are no doubt additional trends that we think are going on, but we cannot r measure at all, such as um, increased donation of or s resale of items on eBay or Craigslist or things like that. So it's um, what you would call multi-determined. <laughs> um, there are a number of different factors that go into making a lighter weight uh, waste stream. Some of them may also be um, a growing environmental awareness and a desire to consume less, it's hard to quantify that. So the extended producer responsibility, which we know, we know a lot of, um, I always get uh, a vendor that comes to me and says, you know, there's a certain amount of weight that you have to buy back, I guess, or you have to take responsibility for as a vendor, especially in electronic waste. Uh, and they mentioned the fact that, you know, in the 1990s and the 2000s, when we had computers, we had these big screens that were extremely heavy, uh, and now we have these light flat screens. So for five of these flat screens, you could you submit one big screen. It's the equivalent of submitting five, so that they're really not doing their job when it comes to uh, uh, producer responsibility, I guess. Do we modify what that looks like? Um, is that through rule, through law? Um, who's responsible for that? Is it the federal government, the state government? Are we responsible for it? And if so, why haven't we modified it to be more reflective of, of what we're actually purchasing now? So I think you're speaking about the New York State e-waste law and the way that the manufacturer's responsibility is calculated. And so um, it's a state law. We've actually been waiting on the state to issue regulations for over five years now. Um, so hopefully that will happen soon. Um, but that would have to be a, a legislative change to the state law. So, so now producer responsibility, I guess, is what I, we're going to extend it. Producer responsibility or EPR, uh, uh, plastic bags, and the five cent fee are all things responsible. The state is responsible for that. We're kind of waiting on, um, so that we can start getting to uh, more diversion or better diversion. Or all things that could that have value. I just want to put that in perspective for people who's responsible for what. Because I get a lot of those meetings, and I don't understand necessarily why people are meeting with me. They should be meeting with state reps. Um, also want to allow for just a quick question from Councilmember Heimdorsch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so today's bill, we are hearing um, to amend the administrative codes in relation to people littering out of the vehicles. Um, I didn't see in your testimony. Do you support this bill? Yes, we do. You do? Both bills. So can you explain how your, how your offices enforce um, uh, this, uh, the, this law of people littering out of the vehicles? Um, can you just give me an example of how um, someone would be throwing trash out and how your offices, your enforcement offices, would then stop them and issue the summons? Sure. So, um, and just to, to clarify at the start, there are two different provisions uh, under the sanitation ad code that uh, apply to littering. The first is um, 16.118.1, which is uh, standard littering. That's you know walking down the sidewalk and, and just throwing a cup on the ground. Uh, what we're talking about here uh, would modify 16.118, subsection 4, uh, which is specifically uh, uh, material coming from a, a 
moving vehicle. Um, so it can be littering. There's also, um, we can issue violations for spillage from private garbage trucks, um, spillage from other types of trucks like uh, dump trucks, et cetera. Uh, but specifically for littering from a moving vehicle, it's a very difficult violation to issue, especially for sanitation. Uh, we have to do two things. One, witness the violation occurring, and two, actually pull over the car in order to serve the violation. So it's, it's not something that we can do easily. We only have uh, about 50 sanitation police officers citywide, and they're focused on other important things like illegal dumping. So it's a, a trade-off of, of concerns. Um, the police department can also uh, issue violations under this code. Um, and I think if, if the, the, these bills were to pass, I think we would sit down with them and talk about uh, how we could leverage their resources as well. You mentioned uh, moving vehicles. What happens if the vehicle is not moving? It's just parked and they throw the trash right out the window. It, it would probably be easier for us to issue the violation. It, the vehicle doesn't have to be physically moving, just a, you know, a, a motor vehicle. So anyone in sitting in the vehicle, whether it's moving or parked, so this bill would, um, so this would uh, apply to both. That's correct. Anyone dumping out. So you have 50 sanitation uh, enforcement offices citywide. Uh, do you believe that that is adequate? So we have we have uh, two different types of enforcement uh, staff. The first is sanitation police officers. These are uh, peace officers in New York State. They are armed um, and they generally enforce uh, things like illegal dumping, uh, theft of, of large recyclable products, um, things that can have an element of, of criminality, if not crim under criminal law, at least an element of criminality to them. Uh, we also have uh, enforcement agents, and enforcement agents are, um, are on foot patrol. <coughs> they look for things like uh, recycling violations. Um, they also enforce uh, illegal posting. They enforce the pooper scooper law. They enforce. Uh, they can enforce littering as well. So they have a, a much broader range of, of uh, actions that they can take. We have a sig significantly more uh, enforcement agents. I don't have the number with me today. It's uh, somewhere around 200 total in the enforcement uh, division. Um, so I think back to your your question of. Uh, I think you asked, do we have enough? Um, I think, you know, we've been relatively straightforward about uh, on the illegal dumping issue that uh, more more staff can help, but just the, the nature of these violations makes them very difficult to enforce. So having just having more enforcement agents or uh, sanitation police officers isn't necessarily the only step that we think we should take. We think that for a lot of these things, violations should carry much higher penalties um, we have a, a bill that we discussed at the rat mitigation hearing that would increase the penalty for illegal dumping. I think this, this bill to increase the penalty for littering from a vehicle is, is a good step as well um, because creating that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, penalty, I think, dissuades people from, from doing what they know is wrong. The headcount of uh, 50, uh, is this something, that, when was the last time you uh, increased your headcount? So you have 50 um, currently that um, enforce illegal dumping. So that those 50 enforcement offices, was the headcount raised to 50 um, over the last few years, or was 50 had the headcount? Because um, New York City's population just increased to 8.6 million. So we need to go with the flow, with the, um, the population, um, and to me, I remember, I think it was last year, two years ago, we mentioned the same thing. There were like 50 enforcement, uh, sanitation enforcement officers, but we keep on remaining at the same, those low numbers. And you, you did mention that it's more difficult to um, actually catch someone who is illegal dumping, who is illegally dumping, or someone that's throwing a, some trash out the window, of especially a, a moving vehicle. So these are the more difficult enforcement um, um, you know, issues that we have to tackle, but the headcount is kind of low opposed to the headcount of ticketing 
those private homeowners who have trash in front of their homes. I think you have a few hundred of those offices uh, that do it, that don't have the power like the, like the, like the sanitation enforcement uh, police. So um, can, you, can you just um, give me the numbers of the head count? And sure. So when was the, last time it was The 50 number is, is an approximation. We can provide you the exact number after this hearing. Uh, and we'd be happy to, to sit down with you and, and speak through those numbers uh, in more detail. But we, we did actually increase the sanitation police officer uh, headcount um, in the fall. We added additional police officers for an illegal dumping uh, squad. And you know I, th I think that uh, the department would support efforts to increase uh, the sanitation police officer headcount. Obviously, there are a lot of things that we would support increased funding for, but uh, there are a lot of difficult decisions that have to get made, but we would we would be happy to work with the council to jointly advocate for uh, for increased headcount on that. So, is it uh, is it okay to send me uh, uh, to send the committee a request of um, you said you would support to increasing the headcount, um, and is it is it okay to send the committee a request of what sanitation fields? Um, what resources you feel that you need that this way we could advocate and you know now we have the uh, the budget just around the corner and you know we could fight and to ask the administration you know to um, to increase the headcount to increase collection or any anything else that you feel may help sanitation um, we'd love to hear from you uh, rather than us bringing it up to you, and then you'll say you support it. But as being in, you know, in uh, a director of uh, research and operations and recycling and sust sustainability for the, for the Department of Sanitation, we'd love to hear from you. If you could, if you could just let us know uh, what resources you need in order to uh, to better do the sanitation workers could better do their job and to keep our city more clean. Um, and also, I just want to ask you, uh, what hours do the sanitation enforcement officers work? Is it a steady uh, tour, or is it a rotating tour? We have sanitation police officers that work both uh, a night tour and a day tour. Um, primarily, illegal dumping takes place at night, so we, we tend to focus resources on that shift, but we have, uh, we have sanitation police officers on both shifts. Um, but to your, your earlier question, I think we're happy to, to follow up with you after this hearing with a discussion about sanitation police officer resources. I think also exactly what this bill that, that Councilmember Matteo proposes is the, sanita the, the sanitation department to look at enforcing these types of violations and, and put together a, um, a study that would show what enforcement resources we think are appropriate or what types of creative actions we can take. Um, something that we haven't discussed yet here uh, and not to go entirely off topic is um, we have proposed previously that it would be great if we could write these kinds of tickets based on license plates and not have to actually pull the car over. Because in that case, we could use uh, sanitation supervisors, enforcement agents, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, that requires state legislation. Um, to go back to the chair's earlier point, a lot of what we work on does uh, involve the state, and so these conversations have to, have to involve them as well. Thank you. So what I understand is that these 50 uh, sanitation offices, these are the only offices that have enforcement power that can actually stop someone. So illegal dumping may happen overnight. People throwing out trash out of the moving vehicles uh, occur during the day. So you have to divide them to different tours in order to catch those that are uh, littering. So if you, if you only have 50 and you have to divide them throughout the city by tour and you have 50 of them, so what does that leave for all five boroughs? Uh, if you need those resources during the day, uh, you need those resources uh, during the evening, and you need those resources in the early morning hours. So I think we, ag I think we agree with where you're going, which is it's, it's, a, it's not an easy decision. Um, we have heard more generally from council members about illegal dumping, so we emphasize enforcing against illegal dumping. Um, but all, all of these considerations have to take into account the fact that you know we have to work with OMB to come up with a, a budget, and there are a lot of competing priorities both within the sanitation department and 
generally within the city. So mm -hmm. I think we, as I said earlier, the sanitation department, not the city writ large, but the department, uh, believes that we, we could use more enforcement uh, resources on this matter. Um, we'll be happy to work with the council, with your office, um, with the committee, and with OMB to see what we can do. Um, but that's, that's sort of where it stands. Yeah, I mean, enforcement uh, does bring in revenue. So uh, even if you had 50 offices, uh, you had three tours, let's say, and you have 50 offices per tour citywide in all five boroughs, that is uh, still um, quite few uh, of, of ha enforcement offices. Um, so, I mean, it is a revenue um, maker, so I think this is something that we definitely need to talk about and, uh, and send a message to those that uh, um, uh, illegal dump and, um, and throw trash out of the cars or those vehicles that are parked uh, at hydrants and just throw out all the trash while they're parked in the evening. So we need to go after them, and this is something that the city could uh, has a revenue that you know by enforcing these laws. So thank you. I'd love to have a further discussion on this. And I think we could follow up on this discussion at the executive budget hearing in a few weeks, also. Thank you. And uh, Councilmember Deutsch, I want to. So in the waste characterization that we're doing, if we increase diversion, we actually save money by diverting trash from landfill to recycling. So uh, when we talk about organics, for example, and the importance of organics. We're talking 34% of trash is organics. If we were able to divert all of that, that's 34% savings in exporting trash to landfill. And we spend about half a billion dollars, almost half a billion dollars, exporting trash. That's a significant amount of money just to get our trash to get thrown out. And now we're also hearing that states and locations don't want our trash, which means the few that do charge a ridiculous rate for it and that's going to continue to happen we're going to continue to have states that are saying no um and other states have said yeah we'll take it but we're going to double our price because we just found out philadelphia doesn't take it anymore and we just found out delaware doesn't take it anymore before you know it there'll only be one place and they could charge whatever they want to take our trash so again we can save money by diversion by expanding organics by mandating that organics happen throughout the city of new york by being aggressive about these tactics and with that savings we could get more enforcement officers for Council Member Deutsch, which is what I think is important. So we're, we're, it's, a, it's a balance here. Um, so I want to talk about organics, um, which I care deeply about. Um, it's set to reach 3.3 million New Yorkers by the end of 2018. Uh, what is DSNY's long-term vision for engaging households in diverting this material from the stream? Um, Sure. So uh, just to clarify, we reached 3.3 million New Yorkers at the end of last year. Oh, so okay. We now, we now uh, serve 3.3 million New Yorkers. It's the largest curbside organics collection program in the country, uh, arguably one of the largest in the world. Uh, and I think, as, uh, as Samantha mentioned earlier, uh, it is still a very new program. Uh, we only actually started the curbside organics collection pilot in 2013 with uh, just over a thousand households in, in Staten Island. And uh, in just the last five years, I think we've seen a tremendous outpouring of support uh, in terms of participation, in terms of uh, growth and awareness about community composting, about um, you know the importance that not only diverting organics from, uh, from landfill, but also using it beneficially to improve the health of our local soils, to create uh, renewable energy. I think that, that we've seen great signs of progress there. Obviously, we have a lot more to do. Um, and we are, are constantly working with communities that have the service to, um, to educate uh, New Yorkers to enroll apartment buildings, um, because as, as you know, uh, we only rolled out the program to one to nine unit buildings. Uh, buildings with 10 or more units um, can enroll and, and will deliver a bin to your house. So um, we encourage those, those buildings in those uh, districts that have the service to enroll. We do community meetings, tabling events, door-to-door um, -door outreach. Um, and so we're, you know, we're really trying to, to get New Yorkers excited about the program. Um, and we're excited to keep 
keep growing the program as we move forward. So I, I saw a post in my building about organics recycling, but I have no organics recycling bin yet, no brown bin. So is that a post that you put there encouraging us to call 311 or someone to get bins? Like explain that process because there are no bins, but they're talking about organics in my building. So I want to know what, what I do as a, a regular New Yorker when I see that post, what, how should I react to that? Sorry, you live in a building over 10 units? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, so you can go to nyc.gov slash organics. We have a form for um, signing up. You can request a site visit, um, and we can get you enrolled. The most important thing is to talk to your super. Make sure your super is on board. Without that support, we can't make the program move forward. Okay, my super is not going to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that right now. Um, but I will have a conversation. I'm the chair of the sanitation committee. It would be very difficult for me not to have this conversation with my super. Um, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to tell you about the experience. I'm going to tweet it out. It's going to be Antonio's experience trying to get organics into his over 10-unit building. Um, wish me luck, OK? Um, so I wanted to, yes, I w and I will. I will. Uh, I hope. Um, what, can, what can be done to reduce the barriers to organics collection? Should organics collection in residences be mandatory? What's your take on mandating it first? I imagine you got to get it out to the city of New York before you consider mandating it. But um, is mandatory collection something that's important to you? And then barriers, like the one I'm talking about. You're going to have to take a, a you know, regular resident from the city of New York to go and engage with his super, who probably won't be too delighted to have to add another layer of, of trash uh, management. So I think you'd be surprised how many of those conversations end with the super agreeing that organics collection is, is a good thing for their building. But um, yes, you're 100% you're correct. We are focused on expanding the program to serve as many people as possible right now before we look down the road toward to uh, mandatory participation. Uh, we think that that's probably going to, to happen at some point in the future, but we, we haven't started to think about timeline or, or what the parameters might be. Um, obviously, in 1991, when recycling became mandatory, uh, we saw a huge increase in participation after that. So I think we would expect the same increase in participation by making organics mandatory, but I think it's, it's a little premature to, uh, to talk details at this point. Um, and really, I think the, the big challenge that we face is that it, it's, it's something totally new. Uh, it's not something that, uh, that New Yorkers have been used to doing. It's not something that really happens in, in most other major cities. You have other cities uh, across the Northeast and, and across the country that are today where we were in 2013. They're just piloting organics collection. Uh, and I think we have an opportunity to lead the way and to figure out what works, especially in apartment buildings, especially when people have very little space and uh, you know, have busy schedules during the day and, and can't devote a lot of time to, to uh, separating their waste. Um, but I think we, we embrace that challenge and, and look forward to working with uh, all of our community partners and neighbors across the city to, to be successful. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to invite you to come to, our, to my district to meet with several non-for-profit organizations that, are de that have apartment buildings throughout the enti my entire system. Los Sudes and St. Nicholas are two non-for-profit developers in my district. I'm going to see if they would buy into, you know, trying to do this in all their buildings and having an entire system and see if that works. Um, then they could speak to me about their challenges and, and or their experience, positive or negative, um, and see if it's something that can work. Do you give, do you give out free small bins to like the tenants um, where they're supposed to put their organics before they put it into the brown bin. Can you just explain that? And I know this is not an organics hearing. I'm just trying to get this information. Yeah, so for any building that's one to nine units, we do give out what we call a kitchen container. So it's a little container that you can put on your counter to uh, take your material out to the curb. All right, thank you for that. And now, um, As we move towards increasing diversion rates, um, would, would the department require new or expanded facilities to process organics and recyclables? This is very important to me, especially when it comes to siting facilities that did not come to Brooklyn, 
um, Northbrook and specifically. And I know right now that a lot of the contracts, organics contracts um, that exist by the Department of Sanitation are, again, in North Brooklyn and in the South Bronx. Um, and when we talk about a fairer city, uh, I'm not necessarily sure that uh, DSNY is contributing to that. Uh, there, we have huge equity concerns. And every time there's a new, a new way, a new uh, material that's going to be introduced to the waste stream, a new recycling idea, a new anything idea, the burden falls on these two, especially significantly poor communities in North Brooklyn and, and the South Bronx. Uh, what are you doing to not let that be the case? That when you do have a program like organics, that we can be supportive and not worry about it being burdensome on you know a few communities. So I think the department would would wholly support uh, any recommendations that the council or, or local communities have for citing new compost or composting or, or uh, anaerobic digestion facilities within New York City or, or in the immediate vicinity. Unfortunately, composting takes up a lot of space and uh, you know it, there just isn't a lot of space left in New York for those kinds of things. We are currently expanding our uh, compost facility on Staten Island to, to be able to handle significantly more food waste. Right now it, it predominantly handles yard waste. Um, and we would love to expand that model to other boroughs Unfortunately, we don't have the space to do so. As to the, the specific concerns about uh, transfer stations in the South Bronx and North Brooklyn, I think we, we hear your concerns. And I think the, it, the administration has been very clear that we support waste equity. Um, we support uh, efforts to, to reduce the burden of waste management infrastructure on, uh, on all overburdened areas of the city, um, particularly North Brooklyn, the South Bronx, and Southeast Queens. Um, but unfortunately, we, we, we have to go where, where, where we can, I think. Um, we don't, because we don't have a, a huge amount of processing uh, facilities, actual composting facilities in New York City, we have to transfer that material into, uh, into other trucks to take it out of the city or um, use available infrastructure at DEP's wastewater treatment plants. And, at this, at this moment in time, the only wastewater treatment plant that takes food waste is Newtown Creek. Uh, it's uh, in your neighboring council district. Um, but we would, we would also love to expand uh, that program and look to the other, I think it's 13 or so, uh, wastewater treatment plants uh, that are spread across the city as well. Just to think that they, it's like what comes first. Um, if you're serious about waste equity, why would you continue to expand a program that puts a larger burden on these communities instead of figuring that part out, the, the where the garbage goes and the facilities to process it before you in, in, institute it. We have, out of all your contracts, private contracts, that you do to take on organics recycling, um, they're almost exclusively in North Brooklyn and South, and, and South Bronx. And it, it kind of speaks to this whole, like, what comes first? You can't talk about bringing justice to these communities and continue to expand the amount of trucks and services that are being that are being pushed through these communities. This is, you can't be both. Um, and right now, it's more talk than anything else when it comes to this specific issue. So much so that it makes me uncomfortable. Who I'm a, a, a huge supporter of recycling of organics. I want it to be expanded citywide. I want it to be mandatory. But then I see all the trucks coming into my district, the DSNY trucks coming through my district, and that there is no solution there. And I'm I'm torn between being a council member of the 34th district. And, be, and being a, a chair of a sanitation committee and wanting to be supportive of, of something that's extremely important. And I don't feel that there is enough urgency within the department to try to figure this out, to try to crack this egg. Um, and, and when you said it has to go somewhere, it does have to go somewhere. Uh, but maybe if we don't do it at all, it doesn't need to go anywhere. Um, so like that's a balance here that, that we haven't figured out. And I hope that you, you do eventually. Also, stopping it from coming to our communities would maybe incentivize other places to want to take it on. If they know that all the contracts in Brooklyn and, and in Brooklyn and the Bronx are not going to exist and that they need to push this somewhere else, there's some value there that could be, that could be created. And it would go, and another facility would say, look, if we're going to take on all that trash, then we'll do it because there's some value. If it's a couple of tons or, and so forth, it doesn't matter. And then another thing is Staten Island. Staten Island is getting a brand new park. Um, 
the, the shutting down of Fresh Kills is what brought in the 16 waste transfer stations into our district, um, and now they're taking organics. They should really consider, or you should really consider, expanding the organics recycling program and sending all the trucks to Stanton Island um, so that we can have some balance. And Mario's not here, but when he comes, I'm going to let him know the same thing. Uh, unfortunately, the, the committee is no longer represented by a member from Staten Island, but I think they would beg to differ. Yeah, I would love to have that conversation about uh, justice and how one community loses a landfill site that's a beautiful park, and in turn, all that trash moves to black and brown communities with no parks and no justice, and how hard it is to get you guys to be on board with that one. The difference between... Uh, you know, a more prominent affluent white community versus a poor black and brown community. Um, so schools now, let's move on to schools. 51% uh, <clears throat> of the organic material in school waste stream was identified as suitable for composting. Knowing this information, can you provide an update on the number of schools participating in the zero waste and organics collection program for fiscal year 2018 and why we haven't, at least in our facilities, expanded it citywide? Yeah, so there's um, just over half of schools, a little over 720 schools are currently enrolled in the organics program. Um, we are working very closely with the Department of Education Sustainability Office and Grow NYC's Recycling Champions to improve the organic separation in these existing schools. And I think until we can see real improvement in those schools, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to expand. So you're looking to like almost perfect it, and find a model that works, and then expand it, or it's just that you're not encouraged I by the, I the terms. I wouldn't. I wouldn't use the word perfect. I think we want to get to a place that we feel really good about. And right now, it's not, it's not doing so well. Uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. Okay, it, I just feel like it's such a controlled environment there. How we would not be doing a good job. It, it has, you know, custodians or or, or folks that are specifically um, responsible to make sure that they separate it appropriately. Uh, there's ways to separate you know, the trash cans inside the school so that the kids are throwing out their organics, their plates, and if it's, all, uh, if it's all organic, they could all throw it in one once we get the, the forks and spoons, I guess, uh, the sporks, uh, to be composable, all put it in the same container. But it's still a problem. Yeah, unfortunately, um, I think that we are working very hard, like I said, with our partners at DOE and at Grow NYC to improve um, the separation there, but there's still a challenge. One thing that I can point to that we are doing is that we're, um, a couple years ago, we launched the Zero Waste Schools Program, so we're working with over 100 schools intensively to give them targeted outreach and resources to properly separate their waste. Um, and what we're going to do is take the best practices from those schools and apply them to all schools. And so a recent example is that um, the DOE provided uh, uniform setups for waste in all the cafeterias in, in DOE schools. So now every time any DOE school cafeteria that you go into will have the exact same sorting station and signage. And so I think that's really important as students move around the system to have that uniformity in the bins. Yeah, I, I, I really think that that's a, a perfect place to make this work. Again, it's contained, it's something that's extremely controlled, uh, and I hope to see progress on that one, but I hear the contamination is extremely high, and it just doesn't seem to be uh, something that's working. In my school, we actually have a, like a sanitation team in one of our schools in my district. Um, there's like a sanitation team that goes around every single classroom to make sure it works in the Young Women's Leadership School. Um, you should actually highlight that school, think about it. Uh, but uh, they just do a really good job at paying attention to it. And the sanitation team walks around and makes sure that they handle all this <coughs> trash. And I'm pretty sure they have a high diversion rate. Um, single stream. Um, the one NYC plan states that converting to single stream recycling will increase diversion by 20%, presumably after contamination. Um, uh, what is the basis for that estimate? Where, how, did you, how did you get there? So we, back in... in 2015, when we were developing the One NYC plan, uh, we looked at a number of cities across the U.S. that uh, in the last few decades had converted from dual stream recycling to single stream recycling. And what we mean by single stream recycling is not just throwing all your garbage away and we'll sort it later. It means combining the blue bin, which is metal, glass, plastic, and cartons, with the green bin, uh, which is uh, commingled paper. And uh, so we, we looked at a number of cities, and I think a 20% increase in diversion, uh, which would translate to an extra uh, about four points 
on our diversion rate uh, is a relatively uh, reasonable and conservative estimate. Okay. Um, are there any drawbacks to single stream collection? There are some folks in this room that are concerned about single stream. Can we, can we just talk about what, I guess, the cost benefit or, or the, the pros and cons and how you, you came to an understanding that this might be the better way? Sure. So, and, and just to be clear, right now we, we have not uh, announced a, a, a timeline or, or sort of a path to single stream. We, we are still very much committed to the idea, um, and we have exactly because of concerns raised by a number of uh, activists and members of the community um, have spent a lot of time with Sims, who's our uh, recycling, our primary recycling vendor, to work through some of these concerns. Um, they've also expressed concerns about things like contamination, about the value of, of the material that, that they have to sell at the end of the day. Um, and I think we, we are going to take a very measured approach, but uh, we also, we know that one of the biggest factors for New Yorkers when it comes to recycling or, or participating in any of our programs is convenience. And one bin is just that much more convenient than two bins. Uh, it's, it's easier to find space in your home, easier to find space in an apartment building, it's easier to understand, easier to remember. So um, we think that in the end, those uh, pros will overcome the cons, but we, we definitely appreciate that, that, that there are some potential concerns and we're taking those into account. Uh, NYCHA, uh, so, so I guess I wanted to, with, uh, with schools and NYCHA accordingly, there must be some internal measurements that you guys are taking in regards to progress being made on a year-to-year -year basis, not waiting for the waste characterization to have to happen to kind of get those numbers. Do you feel that you're making progress in NYCHA, you're making progress in schools um, in regards to diversion? Um, so on schools, we have been looking at, um, you know, it's hard to get an actual diversion rate for schools, but we have been looking at their setouts, making sure that they're um, doing a good job. Um, particularly, we're looking at the schools in the rat mitigation zones to make sure that they're doing a good job with their waste set out. And um, we have seen improvement over the last few months that we've been, as we've been looking at set out, um, the amount of rat activity, things like that. This is my, my last question is um, a waste characterization study of the commercial waste stream. Uh, I believe, and, and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, that the swamp plan called for a waste characterization study of the commercial, of commercial waste. Um, we've yet to see that, hear that. Um, just want to know what's the status of it and, and whether or not it's something you believe you will do. So the, the 2016 Solid Waste Management Plan uh, did call for the Sanitation Department to study the commercial waste system. Uh, and in 2008, we started a study. Um, it lasted about four years. Uh, but unfortunately, because of the financial crisis, uh, was, uh, the scope was, was pared down a little bit. So we've released that study. The results are on our website. But unfortunately, it didn't include a full waste characterization of the commercial waste sector. The last time something like that was done in great detail was 1990, um, so quite, quite some time ago. Um, and as we move forward with the Commercial Waste Zone Project and, and a number of other uh, changes to the way commercial waste is managed, commercial recycling, commercial organics, um, we, I think we could benefit from a, a commercial waste characterization study. But we're also we're taking in a lot of different sources of information, uh, data that we collect, data collected by BIC, by the state, um, data that, that looks at uh, similar uh, business types in other jurisdictions. And we're, we're sort of combining all of that together into what we think is a relatively accurate model of, of how much waste is out there, what the waste is comprised of. But yes, obviously, a, a, a true characterization study would give us a better picture of that. So we should look into that. I'm going to start, I'll talk to the commissioner and to the mayor and just ask um, that that be something we consider. I think it would help our argument long term when it comes to um, zoning uh, and franchising uh, to have a characterization study. Um, so I'm done with the questions. I appreciate your time. Uh, I hope uh, that you guys would stay because um, we have, we have a, one panel. We have one panel. 
um, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So you should you should definitely <laughs> wait. Um, I want to call up Anna Champany, Jacqueline Atman, and Melissa. Can't do it. Still, Melissa, can't do it. I know. Yeah, Sean. Yeah, Sean. It'll be the last time. Is no one else signed up to speak? Okay, thank you. They love what the Department of Sanitation is doing so much, they just came to support you. We're going to call up James Pfeiffer to speak as well. Um, so you can keep, keep, you can fill it out over there. Go ahead. Don't worry about it. We just need that before you leave today. I'll let you guys choose your order. Um, there you go. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Reynoso and other members of the committee. My name is Jackie Ottman, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board, the SWAB. New York City's ambitious goal to send zero waste to landfill by 2030 was set in the 1NYC plan in 2015. In order to reach this goal, the city must increase participation in existing recycling programs, encourage waste prevention, and develop and promote new and different opportunities to reuse products and materials. A well-designed waste characterization study can provide sufficient data to understand the performance of existing programs across the city, as well as inform the design of future programs to reach zero by 30. However, the methodology used to carry out the 2017 waste characterization study was the same as that used in 2013 and, in fact, close to 2005s. This means it did not take into account the programs that have been created and expanded since the city's declaration of a zero waste goal in 2015. While we understand the need to consistently compare changes in waste composition over time, more granular data on recyclable materials and reusable products that are still exported and disposed of are critical to achieving at least a 90% diversion. For starters, the characterization is designed told us very little about the composition and distribution of the residual waste, including its reuse, recycling, and organics waste streams, the very waste streams we want to divert more of in different building types and across different demographics. The 29%, and that's the portion of, of, of non-recyclables and refuse, not the overall, that is deemed as non-recyclable is a very large figure that needs to be understood even more urgently than the numbers for typical recyclables. Some of this 29% is tr potentially reusable, and some, like products and packages that are not designed to be recycled, could be reduced by legislative remedies, such as bans and fees we spoke about before. But we can't identify these potential reductions and diversions without the refined data. The characterization study also failed to show how effective organics collections have been in those neighborhoods that have the program and the difference in our diversion rates between the curbside and drop-off program collection areas. Lastly, the 2017 Waste Characterization Study provides very little specific data to inform what education and strategies are needed where, and also what policy may be required to reduce specific waste streams, such as single-use plastics, or increase the reuse of bulky and e-waste, as well as residuals. If the 20 de 2030 deadline is serious and intended to be met, zero waste program expenditures need to be increased. The city is spending over $400 million on just the export disposal of waste and another $735 million, $39 million per annum on collecting it from households. 
if only a fraction of this was spent on understanding residents' views on and behavior towards recycling, programs in education could be adapted to change long-term behavior and ultimately reduce both collection and disposal costs. Zero waste can only be achieved with a very high participation rate. We on the Manhattan Swab therefore recommend another in-depth study be conducted in the near future to collect data that would lead to a better understanding of the attitudes and behaviors of New York City's residents towards waste, reuse, and recycling in different areas of the city, in different building types, and among different demographics. The last time the city did a usage and attitude study was over 12 years ago in 2005, and much has changed since then. Understanding what is preventing residents from engaging in existing programs will help inform education and communications, as well as the design and provision of targeted outreach while informing the budgets needed to fund these programs. Finally, since there is great reuse potential left in New York City that is not being addressed by the private or public sector, we recommended DSNY characterize the reuse potential at curbside. What is the weight and volume of different types of the durable products that can be repaired or salvaged and their condition, i.e. repairability, that are left at curbside? With information like this, DSNY can design programs to collect reusables at curbside as well as inform the design and use of repair shops and sales outlets or other means to recover more reusable products. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Manhattan Swap this morning. Thank you. And I just want, with the reuse portion, which is something that it seems like you're highlighting in your testimony, um, and I always talk about how New York City and reuse, I just don't, it's just very hard to see, but it's definitely possible. We went to several, I went to several events and I was in a panel at a reuse um, event, and uh, it made it feel like it's definitely something we can do. What you're saying is have opportunities for reusable material on the curb, maybe to go to like a central location that can then be picked up or, or, or by anyone, um, including you know thrift stores or whoever, or reuse like a, what do you call it, flea markets and so forth. And then whatever doesn't get picked up can get, get thrown out, but there's some type of, of diversion that can happen just through having a, maybe a central location for it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, why should we be throwing away all this reusable stuff just because it shows up on the curb and is not diverted through donations? Yeah. And so what we're asking for is more granular data on what percentage of these seemingly reusable materials are in fact reusable with simple repairs or just diverting them into uh, shops and other resale outlets. Oh, and recently on my curb there was a table, <coughs> a, a perfectly good table. It looks like somebody just bought a new one. It's tax season, people are really excited. <laughs> they, got a, they got a table out there. That table was perfectly fine by any other means. Um, if somebody needed a table, they could have used it. Absolutely. Uh, but um, I, I thank you for that testimony and definitely pay attention to the fact that the characterization study seems to be similar across the board. I, I do say this about sanitation. They've been doing the same thing for a long time and they like, they like consistency or they don't like change, let's say. Um, while the, this commissioner um, is, I think, an agent of change and is trying to turn this ship around, um, it still takes some time. And I, you know, it being, I believe, her first waste characterization study under her, um, you know, for it to be modified in some significant way, um, what I think would be difficult to do for her, that her first characterization study be something that's, for, or that's modified to what we traditionally have done. But I will be paying attention um, and making sure that I advocate that we be more conscious of, of the value of, of what a waste characterization can have outside of just knowing information, but actually right. um, uh, uh, assisting with decision making and so forth. Right, and so we, we don't want to uh, burden the current waste characterization study and, and um, you know, uh, uh, prohibit us from understanding long-term trends, but things is changing rapidly in the city as we saw between 2013 and 2017. And we also need that additional data as we're proposing in a companion study, consider it a companion study to update the usage and attitude study so that if we understand why, so that can we better understand things like why that aluminum foil is actually not getting into the recycling stream. Is it because of food soil or is it because of something else? 
All right, well, thank you. Thank you for thank the testimony. You. Good morning, my name is Melissa Yashan and I am a senior staff attorney in the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, which is a member of the Transform Don't Trash Coalition. And I'm happy to be here to provide a response to the recently released results of the 2017 New York City Residential School and NYCHA Waste Characterization Study. We're grateful for our continued partnership with DSNY in working towards establishing a much more sustainable, efficient, and equitable commercial waste system in the city, and would like to thank Chair Reynoso and the members of the Sanitation Committee for the opportunity to comment here today. The Waste Characterization Study revealed important information that can help shape the city's policy decisions in our attempts to move towards zero waste to landfills by 2030. The information revealed in the study will guide DSNY and the Council in prioritizing public education efforts around waste reduction, reuse, organics, and recycling. Unfortunately, as Chairman Reynoso pointed out, we lack anywhere near this level of knowledge about what our city's biggest waste stream, the commercial waste stream, and the millions of tons of mater material thrown out by our huge and diverse business sector every year. As uh, Mr. Anderson mentioned, the last commercial waste characterization study was done in the city in 1990, almost 30 years ago. I don't have to tell you how much has changed in the city since 1990. Since then, there have been profound changes in how we consume information and media, food and electronics, but we have no measure of how this has changed the composition of the city's enormous commercial waste stream. The only way we can craft meaningful policies, infrastructure, and educational campaigns to reduce, re recycle, and diverse waste is by knowing what is in that waste. Conducting a thorough citywide commercial waste analysis is more timely now than ever as the city does move towards major reform of a broken commercial waste system. Our city has committed to fixing this broken system by adopting a zoned commercial waste system, which we strongly endorse and are excited to be working hand in hand with DSNY in preparing for. Under this zoned system, the city will be able to incentivize private waste hauling companies to make major changes to how they collect and process recyclable materials and can encourage major investments in waste reduction and prevention strategies for businesses. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is also an opportunity to incentivize investments in increasing composting capacity in an equitable fashion. This reform represents a crucial opportunity to make systemic changes that would bring us closer to our zero waste goals, while also offering an opportunity to reduce our city's greenhouse gas emissions, improve working conditions for the many workers in the private sanitation industry, vastly improve safety in our streets, and of course, increase equity. In order for the city to design the most efficient and sustainable new commercial waste system, we must make the effort to understand what is in our commercial waste stream and how the various waste streams and concentrations may differ in different regions of the city. For example, we know that downtown Manhattan has much more commercial waste than Northeast Queens per block. But is there a difference in how much recyclable material is actually being recycled amongst the various neighborhoods by these businesses? Knowing information such as that could be incredibly useful when designing the waste zones and determining each area's particular needs. We strongly urge the city to initiate the process for a commercial waste characterization study as soon as possible. Finally, as an environmental justice attorney and advocate, I, as again the chairman, would be remiss if I did not point out the disturbing implications of the 2017 study results and what they have for one of the greatest environmental inequities in our city, those communities that are overburdened by the clustering of transfer stations that process waste before trucking it out to landfills. The waste characteriz characterization study reveals that more than half of what we're sending to landfills should have been recycled, composted, or otherwise diverted. This means that half of the trash that continues to be trucked through low-income communities of color could have and should have been diverted. If for no other reason than to reduce the impacts on communities who for so long have lived with the daily reality of inhaling the fumes of trucks carrying the entire city's garbage, we must do a better job educating the residents of our city about composting, recycling, and waste reduction strategies. We look forward to continuing our work with the council and with DSNY to accomplish these important goals. As usual, thank you, Melissa, uh, for uh, being part of our choir, uh, uh, which is extremely important. And DSNY does need to hear that. I really don't think, again, that there's any level of urgency when it comes to truly addressing the issue of, of inequity in these communities. And NOPI is always on the front end of, of making sure that they don't forget that. So I really appreciate it and thank you for that. 
Chair Reynoso and council members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Anna Campany, and I'm the Director of City Studies at the Citizens Budget Commission. CBC is a nonpartisan, nonprofit civic organization whose mission is to achieve constructive change in the finances and services of New York State and New York City government. Uh, my remarks are a condensed version of the written testimony I submitted. Um, CBC commends the city's commitment to completing these waste uh, studies on a regular basis and releasing detailed results which allow policymakers and advocates an opportunity to better understand the waste stream and assess the city's waste management strategies and programs. Uh, CBC has written extensively about the economics of waste management in the city and I want to comment on the fiscal and policy implications of the results. Uh, while aggressively pursuing zero waste by 2030, the city should be uh, seeking productivity gains in waste collection in order to realize savings, including meeting collection targets, increasing the volume of recyclables, and optimizing labor contracts. Uh, focusing on increasing participation in the curbside organics program before expanding it and pursuing the use of in-sync disposers. Uh, continuing policy uh, development of policy initiatives such as save as you throw and single stream recycling and uh, revisiting a plastic bag man with a fee on alternatives. Um, I won't recap the uh, waste characterization study, DSNY did that pretty thoroughly. Um, so the, the reality of recycling economics is that uh, collecting a ton of recyclables is much more costly than collecting a ton of refuse, uh, $629 compared to $291 according to the mayor's management report. If all else stayed the same, having households sort 55% of their recyclables up from the current 50% would cost the city about $20 million more. Labor productivity at the Department of Sanitation, measured in tons per truck shift, presents opportunities for the city to achieve savings. In 2017, the average recycling truck collected 5.6 tons per truck shift, uh, while the average refuse truck collected 9.6 tons. And because the cost to run a truck shift is basically the same regardless of the material being collected, it's uh, mainly a cost for the salaries and benefits of the two workers, it costs substantially more per ton to collect recyclables. Uh, this presents three opportunities. First, uh, the city's labor contract with DSNY workers sets productivity targets of 10.7 tons for refuse and 6.2 tons for recycling, um, and actual collections are below those targets. Meeting targets uh, could save $120 million per year. Um, recommendations in CBC's 2014 report, Getting the fis Fiscal Waste Out of Solid Waste Collection in New York City, included lengthening routes, reducing collection frequency in areas with low waste volume, and altering shifts, for example, having four 10-hour shifts. The city could continue, uh, should continue efforts to increase recycling participation. More recyclables at the curb will increase recycling productivity. Uh, if the city were able to increase capture rates to 55% and meet productivity targets, the net reduction in costs would be $105 million. Uh, and thirdly, the labor contracts uh, with the USA, the Uniform Sanitation Men's Association, expire in January of 2019. And the city should pursue collective bargaining changes to increase flexibility, productivity, and end certain differentials and bonuses uh, such as the productivity bonus and the dump on shift differential, as well as to expand the use of large containers and automated trucks where appropriate. Um, moving on to uh, organics, organic materials present a major opportunity to decrease the amount of waste being sent to landfills. Organics, which can be readily composted, are currently 34% of an average household's um, waste. Uh, however, as CBC documented in the 2016 report, can we have our cake and compost it too? The current curbside organics program is costly and inefficient. The city reports in the waste study that just 13,000 tons of organics were separated and collected in 2017. Uh, that's just 1% of the citywide organic waste stream and, and still a small portion of the waste stream, the organic waste stream in the districts that have curbside collection. Uh, data suggests that DSMY collects an average of one ton per truck shift for organics, which would translate into an annual collection cost of about $40 million. Mm -hmm. So while the program is well-intentioned and highlights the substantial potential that exists in organics, the city should prioritize fiscal considerations when deciding on next steps. CBC has argued for slower expansion with a focus on districts likely to attain significant participation. The sh city should halt expansion until participation can be increased. CBC has also advocated the use of in-sink disposers, which can crush food waste and send it into the wastewater treatment plants without incurring additional curbside collection costs. 
Uh, lastly, the organics program is currently voluntary. Ultimately, the city will want to make it mon mandatory as was done with the recycling. Uh, you can continue, don't worry. The city is pursuing two policy avenues, single stream recycling and save as you throw, which have the potential to substantially improve waste management. Uh, the city uh, plans to improve sing implement single stream recycling, which presents an opportunity to realize improvements and efficiencies. Under single stream recycling, the ulcers would no longer need to separate paper and metal, glass, and plastic. All recyclables would be put in one container, which would uh, reduce the cross recycling contamination rate um, and is also <coughs> expected to increase participation and collection productivity um, for the trucks. Uh, the city is also studying a volume-based garbage fee program called Save As You Throw. CBC advocated for such a program and supports the city's efforts. An economic incentive is an effective way to get residents to reduce their waste production. In order to encourage more diversion, especially of organics, the program should be designed to charge lower fees for recyclables and organic waste as compared to refuse. Um, and lastly, on plastic bags, uh, while not a substantial part of the waste stream, plastic bags represent a missed opportunity for the city. In 2017, plastic bags were 1.9% of the waste stream, about 71,000 tons annually, and cost about $12 million to landfill. In a blog we put out last week, we advocated for the city to once again act on this issue and pass a plastic, ban, plastic bag ban along with a fee on alternatives. Uh, the waste characterization study provides significant data about the makeup of New York City trash and changing consumer behavior. Uh, it also provides a lens to evaluate current and proposed DSMY policies uh, with regards to waste management with an eye to increasing efficiency and cost effectiveness. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So just so I got two questions. The organics program. Yes. It's, it's like a necessary evil to begin it. Right? We need to start somewhere. Right. Um, I'm going to say it, sanitation might not say it, there's a goal here to make it mandatory in the near future. The only way to do that is to make sure that it's citywide. And then after it's citywide, we, we make it mandatory and then we start m realizing a lot of these uh, this, this cost efficiencies, I guess, that we don't have right now because we're getting a, a very small amount of organics through this program. Um, obviously, a voluntary program is not netting the results that we would like it to, so, uh, but understanding their long-term goal is to make it mandatory. I guess um, th these are like necessary evils of, of inefficiencies when it comes to the budget right now. What, what do you what do you say to that? I guess. Well, I, we the city has had mandatory curbside recycling for paper and metal, glass and plastic, and we are still only at a fifty percent capture rate there. So I think, especially in organics, which is a, a substantial change in behavior for New Yorkers. Um, um, and also noting that, for example, they, they did say that most of the organics that they're getting, more than half is yard waste. It's not food waste. So getting New Yorkers to separate food waste is going to be a big challenge. And I think what we're saying is in the districts where they've already got the curbside, you, you have low participation and you've had it for a few years. So work to get the participation up because making it mandatory does allow you to find will increase participation, but you aren't guaranteed to have the tonnage even then to make it uh, cost effective. So I, mean, I, I do understand it's very much, you know, the cart before the ho like what, what's the right order and there's no perfect story um, and no perfect answer, but I think given how low the participation rates have been in districts where you would expect uh, a more uptake of the program that we should try to figure out how to make it more attractive to yeah, and, and understanding that none of this stuff is black and white. There's a lot of gray area. You mentioned save as you throw, yes. which is also a an incentive-based system to get mm -hmm. folks to recycle what we're currently recycling at a better rate. Um, so, so I just, I guess, um, I just don't want to just so black and white. You know, there's inefficiencies throughout the system, and we're wasting and we're spending a lot of money or wasting a lot of money. Um, I see it as short-term investments or short-term losses for long-term success or goals. Um, so I just wanted to put it in perspective because seeing these numbers is a shock sometimes when you look at it and you're saying, oh, we're just doing a terrible job. I just think it, it's true. Short term, we're, 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 we're going we're gonna to take our losses um, in an effort to hopefully have a better system long term. Sure. I mean, I, I think we do suggest some opportunities for the city to improve collection and, and sort of generate savings on one side, which then you can use to offset sort of the expansion of new programs. Um, then. 
you said the city can say four million in sync disposers in, in sync disposers so just want how did you get to the four million dollar number i I imagine that you're you're taking it from you know you don't need a truck to take any of that garbage because it's going through pipes and the pipes are free um, or the transportation of trash through pipes to the wastewater treatment plant are free but then when they get to the wastewater treatment plant don't so they need to get disposed of anyway so that they'll eventually get on some truck and go to some landfill so the the analysis was completed in that report and it looked at using four districts where there is currently substantial capacity in the wastewater treatment plants to handle the additional volume um, and it did include both on the cost side the cost of providing and installing the disposers the additional costs at DEP in electricity in, in um, utilities because of the greater volume that they're getting offset by some um, biogas revenue that DEP can collect. So that's sort of, there was a DEP portion and then there was the DSNY portion, which was the averted um, disposal cost because you're not taking them to the landfill, which is currently I think about $170 per ton. Uh, so we did try to consider all of the components um, and figure out a net saving. So it's not a, it's not a huge savings, which uh, the collection piece itself is much bigger, but we did account for the DEP cost of having the additional yeah, material. And I don't know if it's happened yet, and I'll ask, uh, but DEP's yet to receive any, uh, to work a deal out with uh, National Grid as to how they can get some capture, it's like a value capture, I guess, from, from this, the, the gas that is produced from their biosols. I don't, there's something wrong with the pipes. It's not in the system yet. Okay. So I just want to let you know that I'm waiting because actually North Brooklyn is the one that would benefit from this. Mm -hmm. um, and they're talking about giving a discount to the community um, because they're giving them this uh, this free gas and there's something going on that it's not working just yet. Uh, but we're excited, you're right. We're excited to eventually get that and um, hopefully savings to all of New York City once once it's completed. I um, uh, just wanna thank you for your testimony. Very, very well done. And we're gonna see if we could use some of the information you gave us today in a couple of weeks when we have our our finance, what do you call it? A budget, a budget, uh, executive budget hearing. Um, so it'll be reflected. And our last testimony of the day to close it out. I'd like to speak about energy conversion. A lot of the issues that were brought up today could be handled by an energy conversion system. So dirty diapers were mentioned, plastic forks, styrofoam, uh, those ubiquitous coffee cups that are um, li paper but lined with plastic, they all could be converted to energy. More than half of what you're sending out can actually has a calorific value and could be converted to energy. And an energy conversion facility could be started in a pilot operation and probably started at one of your transfer stations just to prove that it works. On a large scale, um, a thousand ton per day facility could produce 25 megawatts of power, which could be beneficial to the city in a lot of areas. Uh, in terms of the, re the vegetative matter going to uh, the facility in Staten Island, um, an energy conversion facility there taking just that type of waste would be less than half the physical footprint and size and process a larger volume of waste, of that type of waste, and would actually reduce the physical amount of waste at the end dramatically and leave uh, a beneficial soil nutrient that could be sold. Uh, so a much, much different scenario. The city has been reluctant to try anything new. Nashville, other cities are starting to go into these areas and, and test. It's about time for New York to test. Well, we have, um, our, doesn't the Covanta, Covanta do this in New Jersey? And the city sends uh, trash. They're burning it. I'm Isn't that what you're saying? I'm not talking about burning. So how do you? How would I'm talking you about it? well, this technology is py pyrolysis. There's also gasification, where you create a synthetic gas out of the waste, and then that is used uh, can be used in generators to make electricity, or it can be perhaps put in this pipeline that you referred to before. Okay. So, and I think I've I've heard of both of these styles. Um, just introducing these alternatives to community especially the mine um, it wouldn't it wouldn't go, it wouldn't bode well um to say well, the least so so you you've probably heard of combined heat and power systems little generators that 
actually our apartment building is putting in two in its basement and whatnot. So they can be stationed any place in New York City because they'll meet the emissions requirements. So this energy conversion facility does not have a big smokestack. It has the same emissions levels of this, these combined heat and power systems. Yeah. Well, thank you for that information. I'll, I'll pass it along to the commissioner and see where her head's at on this stuff. But when it comes to most of this energy conversion conversations that we're having, a lot of folks just, um, it's like modern day incineration. Um, that's right, and it's not. And I know. You, you got to break I that. You got to break that. That misnomer, I guess. That's, right. that's, I know. I know I you're know. trying today, but uh, I guess what I'm saying is until we don't feel comfortable enough with getting there, we're talking about two. We have two um, incinerators in North Brooklyn that we had to shut down, um, and just reintroducing that. We have members out here that won't even take a waste transfer station um, in their district because they're they're so. Uh, I guess the PTSD of incinerators. Um, so just wanna, just wanna just put it in perspective. You have a long, a long road ahead of you, sir. Right, but there's just like your cell phone technology and all that has changed over the years. This technology is changing, and it's time to start taking a real look because you have a big problem. You know the trains and you know being turned around in Alabama and whatnot with your uh, the sludge waste and things like that. They can all be avoided. Well, thank you for your testimony. I appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you all. At this point, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.